Hello and welcome to a special episode of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm crime and defence editor Michael O'Toole and I'm joined by our crime correspondent Paul Healy. Hello Paul. Hello Mick. So today we're, we're going to discuss rather dramatic evidence or events that took place in the Special Criminal Court to which you're no stranger Paul. But you were there today for the case of two both men from the border, I suppose, James Jimmy Flynn and Brendan Benny Trainer. Now, they were both charged in relation to the Garda investigation into the murder in January 2013 of Detective Garda Adrian Donoghue. Now, we know that in 2021, I believe, Aaron Brady was convicted of the capital murder of Detective Garda Donoghue. He was given the 40 year prison sentence. But there was a, another investigation into other aspects of the incident, and those two men were charged in relation to the investigation. Now, it's important to stress that neither man was actually charged with the murder. Instead, they were charged with the robbery uh, attendant to the uh, uh, Lordship Credit Union where Detective Garda Donahue was murdered on the 25th of January 2013. And they were also charged with conspiracy to commit burglaries in relation to the gang. So you were there today, Paul. Yeah, and it's it's kind of it's it's like case of deja vu here in that uh, we have the ultimate result of this is when you when you pare it down just to basic detail is very similar in a way to what happened uh, in, in the last time we were in the special criminal court in the case of Jerry the Monk Hutch, um, and as people may remember, Jerry Hutch was acquitted. Ultimately, because the charge against him was the murder of David Byrne in the Regency Hotel, but the specifics of the charge were that he was in the building, that he carried out, that he was one of the gunmen involved. And similarly here, uh, both of these men, Jimmy Flynn and uh, Benny Trainer, were both accused of being directly involved in the Lordship Credit Union robbery. And there were four men involved in that, Aaron Brady being one of them, and then it was alleged to have been Jimmy Flynn and Brendan Trainer, And um, the prosecution simply did not prove their case. And that is what the judges, the three judges of the Special Criminal Court decided here today. And it's just also quite interesting to stress. So the, the presiding judge, the, the most senior of the three judges in the Jerry Hutch trial was Miss Justice Tara Burns. But there are effectively two Special Criminal Courts So she leads one and the other special criminal court is led by Mr. Justice Tony Hunt. So he was the presiding judge in this case. He was. um, Yes, there's three judges in in this case as well. And and he is the presiding judge. But one one of those those judges is actually the same as... uh, uh, one, uh, as as one of the the, the judges in the in the Hutch case, but anyway, that that's entirely entirely different case. We're not here to talk about that. But I think what's interesting, just I want to go back to just because what what we did with the Hutch trial, we went and described you know what it was like to be in the courtroom, and that and and this is a case we've dipped in and out of because. Look, to be honest with you, it, it's a very technical case. Very, very. Uh, there's a lot of detail in it, so it's not necessary. It doesn't exactly lend itself to a, a daily kind of report. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of technical evidence. But but the effectively the charges against these men boiled down to mobile phone evidence and to CCTV evidence and to to their interactions with one another. And Aaron Brady, as as we mentioned, has already been convicted of the murder of Detective Garda, Adrian Donahue. And I think as a result of that, they then, the guards, I think, felt strongly that they would be able to prosecute these two individuals. And James Flynn was actually extradited from the UK um, last year to face this charge. So they wanted to get their man. They believed they had the evidence against him. And if you, you know, I'm not going to bore everybody with every single detail that was heard today, but Jimmy Flynn in particular was a close friend of Aaron Brady and the two of them were in cahoots with each other almost every step of the way leading up to uh, and during and after the events of the what happened at Lordship Credit Union. And there was CCTV footage of those two together uh, of con- and there were uh, details mentioned throughout the case of conversations that they had with one another on the days prior to and leading up to and during um, the, their, their conversations did end uh, mobile in terms of their mobile phone conversations during the period of time that the, the state alleged that they were together uh, committing this robbery. But the key thing, the difference here is, you know, if, if people remember the Aaron Brady case, 
uh, he was alleged to have confessed directly to having been there, which is a huge piece of direct evidence if accepted by the judges, which it was. But in this case, there was no smoking gun. There was no one particular piece of evidence that showed that Jimmy Flynn or that Ben Brendan Trainer were in the building actually carrying out the robbery. So it comes down to what's called circumstantial evidence. And this is a hugely circumstantial case. The Where were they? Uh, and, and beyond all reasonable doubt, where they where were they on the dates uh, the dates that we're talking about and and just 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 one small thing the, the, the Aaron Brady was in trial in front of a judge and jury so it wasn't a question it was the jury accepted this and I think obviously with the special criminal court it's three judges so there's no jury so I I so the the, the jury in the Aaron Brady case 12 people it, it was a very long case. I think it was it was six months or something like that. And and because they found Brady guilty of the murder, I think there was a level of confidence that all the evidence that had been adduced in that case, like as you're saying, the CCTV, the mobile phone data, the lack of mobile phone data where, uh, during the the relevant time, that gave the investigators in Dundalk an awful lot of confidence. But I think this shows who knows what juries decide. I mean, it's one of the great secrets. Nobody's allowed to know. But I think the beauty of the special criminal court is the judges give their judgment and they say, this is why we believe this. So it was probably much more, I mean, I, I always joke about this, you know, if I'm done for crimes against journalism, I would much rather be in the special because I would like to take my chances with three judges because I think they would look at it fully for a matter of law. We don't know what the jury, as I say, we don't know what the juries decide. But I think, you know, the, the, the fact that Brady was convicted by a jury gave Guardian an awful lot of evidence, but obviously it wasn't enough for three judges. No, uh, as I said, this this was a hugely circumstantial case, and uh, and there was no, obviously f- from the judge's perspective, there was no smoking gun, one particular piece of evidence that could show that they were directly involved in the lordship. The, that was the big charge. But I want to go to the other charge that James Flynn was actually convicted of today, and that is uh, in relation to the theft of the getaway vehicle, basically. So the charge was actually conspiracy to commit a theft to break into a house there in Clotterhead uh, and this was two days prior to the robbery uh, at Lordship and um, there was a Volkswagen Passat belonging to a gentleman uh, I'm not going to name him here to be fair to him uh, but he was named in the in the in the actual case uh, he woke up to find his Volkswagen Passat had been stolen his door was wide open and the keys were gone and the CCTV evidence basically matched up uh, to James Flynn using his BMW leaving his house uh, that night and they corroborated through a series of CCTV up and down the area to show beyond a reasonable doubt that it was clearly his very distinctive uh, BMW Series 5 that went up uh, to this scene and where this theft was carried out and then you see it travelling uh, effectively as they said leading uh, the stolen Volkswagen Passat that Volkswagen Passat was then two days later, as we said, used in the actual robbery and uh, the evidence in the trial, phone evidence and otherwise, shows that uh, Jimmy Flynn was involved in going to the scene of where this particular Passat was burnt out and the judges found that or believe that he was involved in some way in uh, helping the gang that were involved in the burning out of this vehicle to escape that scene. That's as far as his involvement that they could prove, but they can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was physically there during the actual robbery itself. And that's the key thing. So he was convicted of that, uh, the, te- the theft of or conspiracy of involvement in the theft of the vehicle that was ultimately used as the getaway vehicle in the Lordship Credit Union robbery. Before we came on here, I was just trying to find out what kind of a sentence he could face for that particular charge. And it's not clear, maybe you might know, but it's a conspiracy to commit uh, rather than like direct theft, although obviously the vehicle was stolen. And then it's connected to another crime, but that's not the crime he's been convicted on. So it's not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what kind of sentence he might face for that. Yeah, I remember years ago, a, a very good barrister friend of mine said a conspiracy, and I can't even pronounce this properly, it's an incohate or in, incohate crime. Now, he told me that uh, a conspiracy offence mirrors the real offence. So if it's a five-year sentence for theft, then the conspiracy should be, should be five years. But then, 
But then that puzzled me because, and this is just off the top of my head, because you remember conspiracy to murder carries 10 years, when obviously murder carries carries life. So look, you know, I'm, we're completely at our depth here talking about legal matters. I don't think it'll be a very big sentence. And it is important to say that Mr. Flynn has been in custody. He's been in custody for more than a year, hasn't he? He has. Yeah, I mean, I do wonder whether time served. Yeah, I think it's very... I was speaking to one uh, source in this today who thinks he might end up serving a six months, another six months on top of what he has already things. So it could be, I don't know, it could be a three-year sentence and then we're backdated. Obviously, it has to be backdated to when he went into custody. But it's not when he went into custody in Ireland. It's when he went into custody in the United Kingdom. And there was a good time period. It was at least a couple of months, I think, I seem to recall, before he was arrested over there and then sent back here. So the time in custody in England will also, it was I think it was London, actually. So that time, so, I, I, I mean, look, again, it's up to the judges, but... I would think we would probably get a you know maybe a three or four year sentence for this. So with time served, I don't think he'll be serving that long, or he will have that long to go, shall we say? Yeah, and I just want to say just to, to speak to the atmosphere in the courtroom. You know, I mean, this was this is a long day, so I hope the listeners forgive me. I, I'm I'm not I'm giving you as much detail as I can remember and as I have in front of me, but uh, there was a lot of very technical evidence in this case, and it went on for it was a five hour judgment today. So it was uh, it was lengthy, um, and there was a lot in it. But uh, in in relation to 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 Jimmy Flynn, it was looking like for a long period of time that he was going to be found guilty, and and certainly there was a feeling in the room um, that that he was going to be found guilty of of the robbery because all of the evidence in terms of his conspiring with Aaron Brady, the CCTV footage of them at a garage together on the day of. Uh, the communications between them right up to the moment of uh, this and, and the assertion that he was involved with the getaway vehicle and with, uh, the, with with picking up those who were involved in the burning out of the vehicle. It was all appeared to be leading one way. And it was really only in maybe the final 10, 15 minutes of the judgment that it started to kind of go the other way that the, that Mr. Justice Hunt was basically saying it's very diff- difficult to establish uh, Jimmy Flynn's direct involvement um, without any admission or forensic evidence and he, he said that on the evidence in the case there were simply too many participants who could have been present at the scene and, and to isolate Jimmy Flynn you, you can't just do that the same with Brendan Trainer. so he said that the, the court can't be sufficiently sure that Flynn was at the scene um, but, but on the basis of the evidence they said that he was a member of the gang a general participant and member of the gang and he said the same thing for Brendan Trainer. Uh, given his involvement with Aaron Brady and with Jimmy Flynn and again CCTV footage of them all on the day that afternoon spending time together Brendan Trainer actually broke his bail conditions so he was on bail for another matter and he was supposed to reside within Northern Ireland and met and and, and went outside of that jurisdiction and met with Aaron Brady and Jimmy Flynn on the afternoon of uh, the, the, the day the robbery uh, occurred and his assertion was oh, we met up we had uh, I think it was shepherd's pie they had in in the petrol station and then they went back and played some playstation together and uh, chicken curry was made for them by um, it, it was a Jimmy Flynn's mother so <laughs> that was his assertion of the innocent activities of the day but Mr Justice Hunt said that it was probably more reasonable that uh, if, if Brendan Trainer was going to break his bail it wasn't for playstation and chicken curry uh it was for something else that these men were meeting up to conspire and to speak about the crime that was ultimately committed later that evening um so he found that both of these men were and it's important to point this out the it's it's funny it's similar to the hutch case in that they were not uh, totally absolved in terms of involvement in the crime but the charge that they were accused of they were found not guilty of. So they were found not guilty of involvement in uh, direct involvement. That's what they were accused of. But the judges said in in their ruling that both of these men were clearly part of this gang that were that were carrying out that plotted this robbery. But that's not enough. So it was sort of close, but not they didn't get it over the line essentially. And I mean it's it's the difference between, shall we say, you know, the balance of probabilities in a civil matter and beyond reasonable doubt. So you have to be, you have to have no doubts, and that's it. And the and the, the to the judge's satis- the, the the state did not prove the case to the judge's satisfaction. Essentially, yeah. Well, I mean, they couldn't place either 
of the two men at the scene. That's the key thing. And they both men had um, alibi witnesses and, and other uh, accounts for their movements. Now, in particular, in relation to Jimmy Flynn, the judges found that he was lying in much of his explanation to the PSNI and to the Gardaí. Um, uh, and in relation to his alibi evidence, it didn't hold water. And certainly they found that th- with the uh, mobile phone evidence and the CCTV that, that he was in cahoots with Aaron Brady to some capacity and involved in this operation. With Brendan Trainer, it was a li- left a little bit more open in that Brendan Trainer claimed um, that he had spent the day with the two lads but then had gone back home. And he his girlfriend gave evidence in the case and she told the court how she recalled um, coming back from a hair appointment and that she saw uh, Benny Trainer in the house and that she was going to go and get food from a takeaway and she asked him what he wanted. She went out and got the food, came back and he was still there. And then there was an incident where he was supposedly uh, washing the dogs. They had two Bichon Frise dogs and uh, he went up to the bathtub with them and dropped his phone in the bathtub and that was his explanation for the phone going dead uh, during very key hours that night uh, because huge um, back and forth between him and Aaron Brady and Jimmy Flynn and then suddenly the phone goes dead during a very key point of time and it's never used again and that was asserted by the state to be you know suspicious and pointed perhaps to his involvement he was saying it dropped in the bathtub Uh, the judges kind of found well you know, there there wasn't any evidence necessarily to support that assertion, but also there wasn't really evidence to to support the state's assertion either uh, that 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 pointed to his direct involvement in being at Lordship Credit Union at that particular time. And another thing that was brought up, you know, in relation to would he have had enough time between when the girlfriend wasn't in the house and when she was back in the house to have been at Lordship and to have been to being back and they actually had kind of proven that it was possible but uh he was he was clean that he uh could be called oh yes there was a call from the psni later that evening checking to see whether he uh was abiding by his bail conditions and that the officer in question actually had noted what he was wearing and that he was clean and there was nothing suspicious about his behavior or his clothing or, or anything he you know he didn't look like he'd just come back from a from a robbery um so yeah i mean there was there was plenty of doubts in the case of brendan trainer uh as to whether he could have been at the scene of the crime uh less so with jimmy flynn i mean it, 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 as i said at that point it, it, when we'd heard all that it seemed like it was going towards a guilty verdict for jimmy flynn so you mentioned circumstantial evidence this was uh, it's fair to say that these were largely circumstantial cases against the two men now i know you don't think this but there is a sort of presumption that you know, circumstantial evidence isn't good as, as good as direct evidence. So direct evidence would be forensics or fingerprints or an admission. But I'm thinking two of the most high profile cases in the last 20 years have been almost well entirely built on circumstantial evidence. One was Graham Dwyer, our, our old friend Graham in 2015. But then in, 2000, in 2007, Joe O'Reilly was convicted because of circumstantial evidence. And I also I often remember a very senior barrister uh, went on TV that night of the, it was a Saturday and he went on the 6-1 News to say circumstantial evidence is very very strong but it's just it's just a different form of evidence you know what I mean now can we talk about the tattoo well the tattoo was perhaps the most uh, and, and and Mr Justice Hunt actually said the most colourful piece of evidence in the trial um, I remember reading about this a while back I think we actually even covered it on the pod because that was a weird day uh, in the trial where uh, this evidence came up about a tattoo on Benny Trainer's back um, and it was forming a key part of the case against him um, to my surprise uh, the judges you know they, they leaned strongly on that this this was a relevant piece uh, of evidence in the case ultimately it didn't change the outcome but uh, they argued for its inclusion in the uh, in evidence because I think it was kind of looked at with raised eyebrows by some people, but I just want to kind of explain uh, to people how uh, the 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 reason behind this tattoo or it's very strange. Uh, and photographs were shown to the court of of this tattoo on Benny Trainer's back that he got in twenty eighteen, um, and it was that was five years after the murder. After, so after the yeah, five yeah. years after, yeah, and it shows four men wearing masks, balaclavas. There there is a gun. Uh, which is similar to or appears to be the same type of weapon that was used to murder Detective Garda Adrian Donahue, 
and there's a woman uh, kissing the gun, uh, also wearing balaclava. There, there was a woman alleged to have been involved in the overall plot. And then there, there's a BMW uh, with, with Boss Boss T, Benny Trainer on it. Um, yeah, it, it was pointed out uh, by the judges that this appeared to be a direct reference to the robbery itself. And they thought that it was extraordinary that Benny Trainer would get a tattoo like that uh, so many years after the fact and after he had been questioned about it as well so knew that he was being looked at and yet had the audacity to get this uh, particular tattoo now he denied it that had to do with it of course but the judges found that it seemed to be a reference and an approval even of the events of what happened at the Lordship Credit Union but ultimately they said nonetheless it doesn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Benny Trainer was actually there at the actual Robbery. And you can understand why the Guardi brought that evidence in, because that would could have been the, the the deciding factor. It could have been the final thread that brought every, everything together. Because as you say, the judges didn't dismiss this evidence. They said it, you know, it was clearly about the murder of Detective Garda Adrian Donahue, but it just, as I said, it wasn't enough. But and they found that it was. You know, they found that it that it clearly was to anyone's eyes uh, a reference to what happened uh, at Lordship. Um, and, and and this is the thing, you know, they didn't exonerate uh, either of these two men. And, and I want to point out that at the end of this, uh, the the the, the counsel, defence counsel for uh, Mr. Trainer actually tried to <laughs> there and then uh, put in part some reporting restrictions, uh, even after his client had been found not guilty, uh, because Mr. Justice Hunt had said, that uh, Mr. Trainer was a member of a criminal gang, was part of this gang that, that were involved in the credit union robbery and obviously the, the murder of um, Adrian Donahue. And, uh, you know, he was trying to, his client, he was trying to argue that his client is, you know, has been found not guilty now. And, you know, the, the, the detail in the judgment maybe should not be published that uh, his client is a member of a criminal gang because, he, you know, he, he, he's acquitted. Um, but Mr. Justice Hunt did not take kindly to that. Uh, and said, "Listen, that's that's a published judgment, um, and uh, he, he basically just said no. <laughs> so you're going to have to deal with it." And I've just remembered, Mr. Justice Hunt was the judge in Grimdor. Oh, wow! Really? I've just remembered him. Now, obviously, he's in the special then, but it was his. He was in the Central Criminal Court, and if I'm right, it was it was his first murder case. Big case to have as your first murder case, but uh, uh, he was he's a very. Uh, very strong judge, you put it that way. Oh yes, it doesn't mince words. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 no messing. What was the reaction? What was the reaction by Flynn and Trainer when, uh, when well, well, Trainer was acquitted of both charges. What was the reaction? Well, I would have said earlier in the day when uh, Trainer, sorry, when when Flynn was found guilty of the theft incident involving the car. He looked like a man who thought he was going away for a long time because I think he thought, I'm being found guilty of this. I'm going to be found guilty of the other. Yeah, I mean, he was white as a ghost. Yeah, I, I would I would say that he didn't really react. He stayed silent, but he just, do you ever just look at someone and they're pale? He was just pale. He, was, he, he looked white and kind of shook by that. Whereas when uh, Brennan Trainer was uh, acquitted of the first charge, um, sorry I haven't even explained this there there were charges in relation to other burglaries uh, at various different dates in 2012 and 2013 and this came as a bit of a surprise um, again this is part this is part of the technical evidence so I'll just try to sum it up very quickly but there was cell site analysis done in this case people might remember that from the Hutch trial there were 122 cell sites in this case and they basically used mobile phone evidence Mo- mobile phone evidence they, for, for the men involved uh, that their phones pinged off various masks uh, at, at times and, and locations in which these various burglaries were committed and they were to use that uh, the prosecution were using that as evidence against them for these various burglaries but Mr Justice Hunt was actually quick to throw that evidence out because he said that it, the state had actually failed to prove uh, with an expert that they had on the stand that the cell sites that was that were being detailed to the court were the same cell sites that the men's phones pinged off. Therefore, they were found not guilty in relation to those burglaries. And you could see from Mr. Trainer's reaction, I mean, he was kind of holding his breath 
like this and then just kind of exhaled like okay right uh, and, and it was going his way and he, he he looked very happy by the end of things i mean he was beaming uh, with delight that he had been acquitted and um, in his case i thought he was going to walk out the door but um I, i'll just be careful with this but I, I i i think he has other matters still pending uh so he didn't walk out the the he didn't walk out the doors today um but he has been acquitted uh you know he, he there's no more involvement between him and this particular case so he looked like a very happy man uh james flynn still has uh, a pending sentencing happening in in november we'll see where that goes but i think i think the guards are very very disappointed here i mean i you know i'm speaking to sources i'm sure you have too there's a huge feeling of disappointment um i mean they took this case you know, I mean, they got Aaron Brady obviously convicted and then they felt probably confident that they could get the rest of the gang. They extradited James Flynn, brought him back here. Um, I think they were confident uh, that they would have a guilty verdict, especially in his case. Um, so there there was, I mean, there were a lot of gasps uh, when he was found not guilty uh, of involvement in the, in the actual robbery itself. A lot of people gasped openly in the courtroom um, when that happened. Wow. And was Aaron Brady's father there, Tony? He's been, he's, he's campaigning for his son, as is his right. I, you know, he's very forthright in the belief that his son is innocent. And I don't think anybody can blame him for that. He's entitled to fight for his son. Uh, so was he there? Uh, he was there, but he wasn't allowed into the courtroom. He was sitting outside. This uh, this happened prior. I wasn't in this particular hearing, but there was an incident with Tony Brady uh, where he had been um, publishing material online uh, that Mr. Justice Hunt did not take kindly to put it that way. And uh, he was barred from being in the courtroom. He issued a letter into the court this morning and Mr. Justice Hunt, uh, basically asking to be readmitted and Mr. Justice Hunt dismissed that and said he's not coming back in here. Uh, so Tony Brady, in fairness, he was there all day. He sat outside the courtroom, but never was allowed in. Because I'm just wondering, uh, listeners might be aware that Obviously, Brady has been convicted, but he is appealing it. And I wonder, I'm going to ask him to put you on the spot. Do you think this is a this is something that um, the Brady camp, shall we say, will be encouraged by? I, I, mean, I think they will. Like, I mean, the, the, the two men have been acquitted of, of the, the central charge, uh, direct involvement. And, and the key thing there is, you know, it's, it's all circumstantial evidence against them. And the judges found that there was nothing placing them there at the scene of the crime. I think the Brady family will try to argue that that's the very same thing with Aaron, that there was nothing placing him directly at the crime, that it was circumstantial evidence. The difference with Aaron Brady is that he was found to, and there was plenty of evidence against him in terms of, directly admitting uh, to, to murdering uh, Detective Garda Donahue, uh, that, that, that's a different thing. And you, you probably re- recall covering that trial yourself. And then the difference, the difference is as well, as you said already, that wasn't a special criminal court matter. So No, and um, I remember another barrister telling me a couple of times that courts are very unwilling to overturn the decision of a jury. So that's, so that's in the say pro or con, whatever camp you're on, if you were on the the Brady side, I think that would be a major con. It would be very difficult hell to get over. But then on the other side, they could argue, look, three seasoned judges and respected judges have given considered and reasoned judgments on this evidence, on the same, effectively, apart from the direct admission evidence, on the technical evidence, the cell site analysis, the CCTV, all that sort of thing. So that would be a positive for the Brady side. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Well, it's it, it's important to also argue the point that you know it's it, it, it this this trial did not exonerate Aaron Brady, and far from it. You know, I mean, the evidence w- was stacked against Aaron Brady even in this case. Um, Aaron Brady and Jimmy Flynn conspired together in the theft of that the Volkswagen vehicle that was used as the getaway car. There's plenty of evidence in relation to their communications with each other before and during and after. And, um, you know, there was even evidence in relation. And this this is why I thought James Flynn was going to be convicted. There was evidence about the two of them together, Aaron Brady and Jimmy Flynn, uh, the day before and the day of uh, the Lordship Credit Union, basically scoping out, scouting the scene, doing a dummy run, like basically making, you know, and, and Carl on CCTV doing that. So the two of them were in cahoots together planning and plotting this thing in the days before 
uh, and they had evidence in relation to both of them. And that, so I, I don't think this exonerated Aaron Brady. If anything, it, it continued to show his guilt and involvement in it, in my opinion. I yeah, no, I don't think it's a question of exonerating him. I think we'll have to be pretty clear about this. The, ju- the jury has decided in relation to Aaron Brady. So it's not as if, you know, Brady's defence team could go, will go, ah, oh, we don't like that verdict, and we'll go again. It, as you know, Paul, an appeal is purely on a point of law. So their argument is that some evidence will have been adduced. Like, I don't think we've heard the grounds of appeal yet, but I would guess that they will be arguing that probably the, the, the evidence from the American witnesses, the two American witnesses, the male and female, should not have been entered into evidence. So it's up to the three judges of appeal. There's no jury in the uh, Court of Appeal, so it'll be three judges in the Court of Criminal Appeal. And they will look at the grounds for appeal and they will decide, as, as they did with Dwyer uh, a few months ago. So, But it's on a point of law. So their argument will be that the judge, the trial judge, erred in law in some way. But that's up to, we'll have to wait for the judges to decide that. And we'll have to see what the, the grounds of appeal are. But, you know, that's a, an educated guess, shall we say. Yeah, well, I, I th- and I think you're right overall that the Brady family will be happy with this result today and they will feel that it does strengthen uh, their case and a potential appeal for Aaron Brady. Um, I just think that there was a lot of evidence heard today, even in spite of the not guilty verdicts, uh, that you know the judges were very much pointing to Aaron Brady's guilt and involvement throughout this. Obviously, Aaron Brady wasn't on trial here, but every interaction and every involvement here by this criminal gang which they acknowledge existed involved Aaron Brady at the centre of it. Yeah, and I mean, be playing devil's advocate, I know exactly what you're saying, but the, the, the three judges in the Court of Appeal won't be, I don't think they'll be taking any cognizance of this because it's just purely about the Brady trial itself. You know, you know what I mean? They're, I don't think they're going to be able to That's say, oh, the, the specialists. So, uh, so it's it's probably still all to play for in relation to that appeal. And, and that itself, I think it's going to be later on this year or early next year. And that'll be very interesting to see what the grounds of the appeal are and how they approach it and how the judges decide. Yeah, I imagine this is very disheartening and, and upsetting for the family of, of Detective Garda Donahue. Um, I mean, it's been a stressful couple of years for them. Um, you know, it's probably not easy to have to go through this whole court's process and then to find two persons that uh, found not guilty in relation to it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's not over yet, I'm sure. I mean, there are plenty of people that the guards believe were involved in this conspiracy. I think up to seven or eight people, they believe in total were involved in it um so they would have had ideas as to who was in the car so but look it is what it is i i wonder though does that does this weaken their case going forward um and you know now that two people that they have alleged were centrally involved have been acquitted yeah yeah and i think it's fair to say look the investigation's ongoing but i think it's fair to say that i think there's one well two other people uh, that I would know of that would be focal points of this investigation. And I think if there had been enough against those people, I think they would have got them back. I think both are outside the jurisdiction. I think they would have got got them back by now. So uh, I think it would probably be unlikely that anybody else would be charged. Yeah, well, look, it's fa- I mean, it's fascinating. I, I, you know, we were saying, and I don't want to keep bringing up the Hutch trial, but it's only relevant because um, obviously that was a not guilty verdict in the special um I don't know whether that was the first, but it was certainly there. There, there have been very few not guilty verdicts before the special criminal court. Now you've got two more, and you know if you're arguing for uh, the innocence of these two men, well, then you could say, you know, again, this proves uh, the legitimacy of the special criminal court and that it does work, and that it, it's not some conspiracy that the state is out to get you no matter what. These two men have walked; they've been acquitted. Um, so. You know uh, that 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 that's proof that the special criminal court works. So there have there have uh, you're right. It's I mean I did remember we did the stats. There was sometimes there was a hundred percent conviction. It's now that a lot of people would have pleaded guilty at the special criminal court, but there, no, there have been people acquitted. The most famous of which I suppose is John Gilligan. You have to remember he was acquitted of the murder of Veronica Gear. Now he got a humongous sentence because he was also uh, charged with drugs importation. And he got a humongous 28-year sentence for smuggling millions of Euro- pounds, euros worth of cannabis. That was reduced to 20 years and he did 17, I think. But, you know, Gilligan got acquitted of the murder charge. So, you know, acquittals do happen, but look, more often than not, 
talk to any barrister and they would say, oh, once you go to the, the special, you're in serious bother. But look, that's that's two in the last year. And then, you know, there are there have been others. But look, a vast majority of people are convicted by the special. There's no doubt about that. Well, I, I do. And I'll probably leave it on this point. I wonder what you think. You know, I mean, is this another case of the guards and the state, the DPP ultimately, going for the wrong charge because you know in the evidence against Jerry Hutch obviously I mean the judges did find him not guilty but they said there was evidence there to suggest uh, that he was in possession of firearms so maybe firearms offences could have been taken against him Um, in relation to these two men they have been found to be members of a criminal gang Jimmy Flynn I mean they said there was evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that he was an active member of the gang that carried out this robbery Yet, yet he's being found not guilty. So, I mean, should they have taken charges of... I mean, now we're talking about, with other people, a, a charge of uh, directing a crime gang or being involved in an organised crime gang. Should they have sought charges like that rather than direct involvement, placing them at the scene? Um, yeah, where the wrong charge is sought, I wonder. Yeah, I see. Uh, I'm not taking the mic, but you and I in this regard are... Totally amateurs. Maybe, maybe we're slightly gifted. It's more knowledgeable amateurs. So, you know, it's very senior law officers and very senior guardy were involved in this. So all I can say is, I mean, it's clear they thought they were putting the right charges. Yeah, but it's it's a sad state of affairs, I suppose, in that, yes, these two men have been found not guilty. But, I mean, the judges did not exonerate them. And they did say that they were probably involved in the commission of the crime. Uh, yet they've walked free. You know, it's extraordinary. And, and, and it's funny when you were talking about that, what was going through my mind was what the trial, the presiding judge in the special for Gilligan said. He said he had grave reservations that Gilligan was involved in this murder, but there just wasn't enough. And it sounds exactly what like Mr. Justice Tony Hunt today. You know, it was sort of the same thing. These people are these people are bogeys, basically. But there's, there's not enough to sustain the, the, these charges. Well, in, in relation to a uh, trainer, two charges in relation to Mr. Flynn, the, the one charge. Yeah, I, I th- that's the thing. The judges were not saying these men are saints, you know. They 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 very much pointed to to their uh, involvement in this gang and the overall commitment of the crime. But what they were accused of ultimately, at the end of the day, they've been found not guilty, and that's that. And they, I'd say that's that for us, is it? It is. My head is wrecked. I hope that we have explained to you as best well uh, as we can uh, what happened there uh, it was a very technical trial there's lots and lots of technical evidence and, and I suggest if you want to read more there'll be plenty in the papers there's great coverage uh, not just from myself but fantastic coverage uh, from the court reporters you've got uh, you've got Owen in there and Ali uh, doing doing the, the the Lord's work and they have all of the detail as well that I probably didn't pick up on so pick up a paper uh, tomorrow and, and, and read all of that uh, if you want more detail right so we'll be back we'll probably talk again later on the week because i think it's going to be a very busy week in crime in ireland so we'll have we won't talk about them now but say we've got the the, the vote of no confidence against the commissioner we should know the results of that on wednesday you and i would have a view that it's going to go a certain way in fact i was talking to one source tonight who there's talk of a, a turnout between 70 and 80 percent so if that happens we only know it's going to go one way. I don't think there's any chance of the, the, the Commissioner Drew Harris winning this vote. So it all depends how many people voted and how big the margin is. So that's out on Wednesday. So we, we, we shall come back, back, back together again later in the week and we'll, we'll see what other stuff... Because I want to talk about a couple of stories I did last week. and I, 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 I spoke to a man down in down the country uh, in Port Leash who's an alleged war criminal from Eastern Europe. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. So there's plenty we'll talk about next time around. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen between now and Wednesday. Anyway, listen, thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. Talk to you again. Cheers. (laughs) Thanks, everybody.